Okay, so this is us, the ones who are behind the magnets organization. Uh, the format of the talk, uh, of the talks, talks should last about 25 or 30 minutes. Uh, you should keep your microphones muted uh, during the presentation. Uh, you can ask uh, questions if your questions were not answered during the talk. And if you don't want to use the microphone, you just type uh, your questions and the convener will read them out. And after uh, the formal sections of the questions, we have uh, a few minutes you know, to, to catch up uh, in more informal uh, way. So today's talk will be given by Eli, Eli Mansbach uh, from MIT. And the title is Micromagnetic Modeling of Domain States in Titratinite. So that's it. And uh, welcome, Eli. You can start anytime you want. Awesome. Great. OK. Um, yeah, so as um, Florence just said, um, my name is Eli Manspeck. I'm a, a fourth year grad student at MIT, and I'm really happy to be here and invited to talk about some work that we recently put out looking at the domain states in uh, Tetra Tetratinite, this very kind of special uh, meet, uh, mineral that we see in meteorites. Um, so just to start with some context, in the last few decades, the application of paleomagnetism to meteorites and meteoritic samples has really greatly broadened our knowledge of the solar nebula and planetary evolution generally. However, it's really important to remember that all these ha events that we're trying to study happened about 4.5 billion years ago. And therefore, a very important aspect of these studies is identifying paleomagnetic recorders that can not only record a field, but also retain that magnetization over the lifetime of the solar system. Often our preference is for these recorders to be in the single domain state, since we know how to recover uh, reliable paleo intensities from these recorders, and we know how to remove their overprints. And in the past uh, few years as well, uh, we also noticed that we really like it if our grains are in the potentially the single vortex domain state, as these domains uh, states are very, uh, retain very extremely stable magnetizations and therefore have kind of expanded the sizes of grains that can be high quality recorders. However, if our grains are smaller than the single domain or too large to be single vortex, then they might be in either the super paramagnetic state or the uh, multi-domain state. And the super paramagnetic state is not good since it has very short viscous relaxation times um, relative to these uh, laboratory time scales, so they can't retain a, a magnetization. And multi-domain carriers tend to be very bad since they're often easily remagnetized and we cannot recover accurate paleo intensities from them. And so this is kind of the typical view of how we expect domain states to change um, as we increase grain size, um, starting from superagnetic, moving into single domain, single vortex, and finally some type of multi-domain state. And this is what we've seen uh, for very common uh, paleomagnetic recorders like camasite and magnetite. Uh, so what I'm showing here is the results of some micromagnetic modeling from uh, Mux Worthy at all 2015. And this is a plot that I'm going to come back to at least a form of it a few times during this talk. So I just want to take a second here. Uh, so this is called a butler Banerjee diagram, where we have length on the y-axis, so essentially how long the grain is, versus the axial ratio on the x-axis. And the axial ratio is the width to length of our uh, grain. So one is essentially a cube, and zero is... Uh, Kind of like a very elongated wire, so to speak. And what we see for uh, camasite, which is what this plot is for here, we move from a super paramagnetic state at very low uh, grain sizes through a stable single domain state uh, into a kind of single vortex state, which are these grains up here, and then finally into a multi domain state. However, the focus of my talk here today is looking at a different paramagnetic recorder, which is tetratainite. Um, so tetratinite is this very interesting uh, mineral. It's an ordered iron nickel metal um, that has been identified as a really good paleomagnetic recorder in part because it has very high coercivities, um, often greater than about one Tesla. Um, often tetratinite that has been used for paleomagnetic studies 
um, have been found in what is called the cladizo microstructure, which I show an example of here to the left-hand side. Um, this forms as a result of a spinel decomposition, which kind of gives it this wormy looking texture here. And where each of these little worms are, is a tetratainite grain. However, tetratainite can also form as kind of more individual grains instead of this kind of closely, densely packed, wormy texture. Uh, for instance, in this middle panel here, I have, uh, I'm showing an image of tetratainite grains, which are the white grains um, kind of embedded in a chemocyte matrix. And this is what's called plusite. Uh, we also find this in meteorites as well. Um, and it got, tetrain can also occur as more individual grains um, kind of embedded in the silicates and primitive achondrites. So and that's what I'm showing over to the right here. These are tetrachainite grains embedded in a olivine or pyroxene grain. So as I said, tetrain has become very useful in the past decade uh, for paleomagnetic studies of mostly iron meteorites and a few chondrites as well. I'm not showing a completely exhaustive list, but just to get that sense of how many studies have been put out that focus on this particular uh, paleomagnetic mineral. Um, but one of the things that we see is that in all these studies that the sizes of the tetrachainite grains um, can uh, wildly vary uh, orders of magnitude. And so if we were to take the essentially the sizes of uh, the tetrachainite grains that we see, say, in the cloudy zone and put them on this type of butler banji diagram where we have length versus actual ratio, we see that they span a, a range of lengths. Um, considering that there is a wormy texture to them, I'm kind of going to let the uh, the size ranges of the tetrachainite vary in terms of the x-axis here, which is shown by those double-sided arrows. But I'm going to focus more on the uh, kind of the extent in the y direction. And so we have uh, some tetrachainite in the cloudy zone in like 4A irons that tend to be the smallest, which can be maybe down to about 10 uh, nanometers. Um, but also there's mesosiderites that can be all the way up to hundreds of nanometers. And despite its uh, use as a paleomagnetic recorder, uh, we're not really sure where in this diagram uh, tetr tetrachainite domain states actually fall. And so we might be concerned for, say, that if I kind of just draw some um, ad hoc um, domain states here, uh, and we'll fill this diagram in later, that's the purpose of this talk, we might be concerned that maybe some of these recorders are actually super paramagnetic, um, whereas some might be either single vortex or multi-domain. So we really want to constrain the domain size ranges of this mineral. And so that's really the goal um, of this project, which was to determine uh, the domain size ranges of tetrachainite and under what conditions is magnetization is stable against viscous relaxation and remagnetization. And so for the most part, I'm going to be talking here just about non-interacting tetrachainite at room temperature, but I'm going to come back to interactions at the end. So we approach this through two different mechanisms, um, through trying to do this from an analytical perspective and also through micromagnetic modeling. So I'm going to start with some of the analytical solutions here. Um, I wanted to avoid showing a bunch of equations, so I'm just going to say, for at least right now, that um, we calculated both the superparamagnetic to single domain uh, transition and the single domain to multi-domain transition just using the equations that you can find in Evans and Mikkelheny, 1969, and Dunlop and Ozimir, 1997. Um, however, I did say I want to avoid equations. I want to show one just very, very briefly here. Um, and so this is the uh, a very general equation that determines the threshold for the superparamagnetic to single domain state, where we have relaxation time on the left as a function of a bunch of different variables, but essentially it's a ratio of the magnetic energy to the thermal energy on the right-hand side. And so um, one thing that this equation is highly dependent on and what makes tetrachainite so special um, is this microcoercivity term here. And the microcoercivity is kind of an interplay between uh, two different anisotropies mostly. The magnetocrystalline anisotropy, which is connected to the energy associated with the crystal lattice, and shape anisotropy, which is connected to the uh, kind of the habit, the elongation of the grain itself. And what makes tetrachainite very different from, say, magnetite and chemocyte is that its magnetocrystalline anisotropy is incredibly large, um, about 20 times larger than that for chemocyte and about 100 times larger than that for magnetite. And what this means is that the magnetocrystalline anisotropy of tetrachainite is always larger than its shape anisotropy. And that's going to become a very important kind of theme running throughout this talk. And so we take that first equation that I showed and kind of manipulate a little bit and reformat it. Uh, we can actually turn it into an equation that is length 
first axial ratio. And that's what we really are showing on this Butler Banji diagram that I'm going to uh, be talking about during this talk. Um, and so I've kind of just shown the uh, magnetocrystalline anisotropy, which is uh, this 2K. And this whole term over here is a shape anisotropy. But essentially, this uh, value here is always larger than this value, no matter the elongation of the grain. OK, so now we can fill out this diagram for the analytical results. Um, here I'm showing the transition from the superparanetic to the single domain state. Um, and you'll see that as the grain becomes elongated, um, that threshold side increases, which is what we'd expect. Um, but this is actually a little different than what I showed initially for camasite. You'll notice that the uh, effectively the shape of this uh, threshold is very different, whereas for the camasite, we kind of have like a U shape, whereas for tetrachinite, it's this constantly increasing value. And that's really a direct result of this magnetocrystalline anisotropy, always dominating over shape anisotropy. And that's very cool, I think. Um, I've also put here the transition for the single domain to two domain based on our analytical solutions. And we also calculated for a two domain to a three domain structure as well. And what we see is that um, our uh, single domain range only lasts from about five nanometers to 80 nanometers for cubic tetratainite. And I'm going to come back to this a little bit later, but you already can kind of see that all the cloudy zone tetratine I, I showed before don't really all fall into this range. So I want to uh, spend a little more time going through the magnetic, uh, micromagnetic modeling, since this is kind of the bulk of um, the paper that we put out on this. And to accomplish this, these modelings, we use uh, the Merrill software. Um, this is uh, Wynn Williams is one of the co-authors on this paper, and this is coming out of his group at the University of Edinburgh. And Merrill is an extremely powerful tool that um, is really well uh, adept for what we want to do here. Uh, one of the things that Merrill can do is that it can actually determine viscous relaxation times between uh, micromagnetic states. And so what I'm showing here um, on the left-hand side, um, this is for a six nanometer tetratine IQ, is that I've initialized, um, essentially I'm determining um, the energy barrier uh, between two uh, magnetization states, one with the magnetization point along the negative x-axis and the other with the magnetization point along the x-axis. And so that is the kind of uh, blue kind of turning into red here. And this energy barrier um, allows us to actually calculate the relaxation time of the um, between the two states. And this gives us a sense of how long it would take for uh, the magnetization in one state to spontaneously uh, flip to the other uh, the other state. And this um, energy barrier here is akin to, uh, comes out to about three times 10 to the 17th power in terms of years. And keep in mind that the solar system is only 4.5 uh, times 10 to the nine years. So this is already orders of magnitude longer than the solar system. And it turns out this six nanometer uh, threshold is really the transition from superionetic to single domain. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll add that more to the pot later. Um, the other thing that Merrill allows us to do is just find the least energy state of tetratina at a variety of shapes and sizes. Um, so what I'm showing here, these are all for cubes. I have a 50 nanometer cube on the left and an 80 nanometer cube on the right. Um, you'll notice that the 50 nanometer cube is about uh, is in the single domain state, whereas the 80 nanometer cube is in what I would call a two domain state, where we have this domain wall that runs through the middle. This transition between these two states occurs at actually 64 nanometers. But one of the things that's very different about tetratinite than chemosite and magnetite is that there is no single vortex transition here. Um, so just to kind of nail that home here, no, no single vortex state. Um, and that's mostly due to the, this really high magnetocrystal anisotropy that tetratinite has. The, it's so large that the individual dipoles within our cubes or within our, uh, our grains here don't want to be canted relative to the easy magnetic axis of tetratainite. So tetratainite has no uh, single vortex state because it's high anisotropy. And that's very important because this really constrains the sizes of our high quality uh, tetratainite recorders to just a single domain state um, compared to, ma uh, say, magnetite or camasite. So if we were to kind of take this view of domain states as a function of grain size for tetratainite, we would have to completely strike. Uh, a single vortex from uh, this uh, typical picture. Okay, so we did this for, uh, we did all this micromagnetic modeling for a bunch of different sizes and shapes, 
and we determine the transition from single domain to two, what I'm going to call two domain for um, a bunch of tetratainite. And if we overlay our analytical solutions um, and our micromagnetic modeling solutions, we get a Butler Banerjee diagram that looks something like this. Um, so we see that the superionetic, the single domain thresholds align very well between the analytical and micromagnetic solutions, not as much for the single domain, the two domain solutions. Um, that's not particularly unusual. Um, that's been seen for other uh, minerals as well. Um, it might be due to the difference between the analytical solution relying on a very uniform single vortex state, whereas the micromagnetic modeling often the single vortex or sorry, single domain state is more of a kind of flower state. Um, but generally speaking, we see that the uh, the single domain range for tetratainite uh, for cubes is only six to 64 nanometers. And as far as we kind of reached a limit in terms of memory as to what we could actually model, but at least up to about 160 nanometers as uh, the grain becomes more elongated as we expect. And so tetrachainite occupies the single domain state um, only, let's say, between 6 and 160 nanometers, depending on the elongation of the grain. Um, and this is important, kind of harping back to the single vortex state before, is that grains outside of this range are expected to not be very useful for paleomagnetic analysis, since we have to go straight from a single domain to a two domain state. And so this two, lack of single vortex is very interesting to us, and we wanted to kind of explore the two domain state a, a little bit further. Uh, so we did some very similar modeling of the viscous relaxation time um, and calculating these energy barriers with uh, Merrill between uh, two different two domain states, one that is aligned uh, horizontally and one that is aligned vertically. And so on the left, you're, showing, you're seeing another one of these movies that Merrill can construct moving from one state to, the, to another. And on the right hand side here, I'm showing uh, what that energy barrier between these two states looks like. And we see that there's actually a few metastable states that um, lie in between. And we recalculated energy barrier between these metastable states to further refine this energy barrier. But the energy barrier between a two domain state and any of these metastable states is extremely large. Um, it's uh, comparable to about three times 10 to the 4,326 years, which is something extremely outrageous when we keep in mind that the solar system is really only, as I said before, 4.5 times 10 to the nine years. So um, unlike um, multi-domain grains, which we usually think of as fairly not stable domain states, it turns out tetratainized two domain state is extremely stable over solar system time scales, And that's important because uh, that means that while we don't have the single vortex state, multi-domain tetratana, at least this two-domain tetratana that we've modeled, can actually retain its magnetization over these time scales, and therefore it could possibly be good paleomagnetic recorders. So that's from a viscous realization times point. But what we also want to see is how these two-domain grains react to external fields. And so one of the things that I did with Merrill was actually create hysteresis loops. Um, so just showing... Um, Mag magnetic or uh, age magnetic field on the x-axis and um, magnetization over saturation magnetization on the y-axis. And so I started with a 70 nanometer grain, which is initially in a two domain state. And we see that as we actually increase the field, um, that uh, the, the magnetization increases as the domain uh, wall gets displaced to the side of the, of the uh, tetratainite grain. And eventually that domain wall is completely destroyed. Um, you'll notice that the actual field needed to destroy that domain wall is about 250, 300 millitesla, uh, which is not something that you get from a planetary field that's only about 300 microtesla. Um, but what's particularly curious about tetratainite is that once you destroy the domain wall and put it into a single domain state, um, when we actually remove the field, instead of uh, the, the grain actually returning back into a multi-domain state, instead will remain in that single domain state and actually act as a uniform grain um, as we keep on cycling this hysteresis loop. And so what we take away from that is that two domain grains uh, that are placed into a single domain state will stay there after that field is removed. And that's extremely important because that means if there exists a mechanism that can destroy the domain wall, uh, the size range of uh, single domain tetratainite actually increases. So if we go back to our kind of overall view of tetratainite domain structure, we've gone rid of single vortex state, 
but in the if we have a mechanism that can expand this um that can shred a domain wall we can actually essentially grow the sizes of single domain tetrachainite that is uh stable so let's put this uh, I've shown this Butler Banerjee diagram before with our results. I want to zoom in just on this kind of blue dotted region. And so this is, I've kind of now taken our Butler Banerjee diagram, zoomed in and over plotted uh, the cloudy zone uh, islands um, size ranges here. And what you'll see is that we kind of just draw a horizontal line at about 64 nanometers. We see that tetrachainite in the cloudy zone, actually, a lot of it falls in what we expect to be a two domain state. Um, there should be some single domain greens, but there also should be some bad two domain states as well. Um, and this is not what we see in the cloudy zone. We actually see fairly uniform magnetization. So an example is that if we look at these IAB iron meteorites, uh, what I'm showing here is uh, what's called an XMCD image. So this is shows the magnetization of the grains relative to a probe beam. And I've highlighted the cloudy zone here. Um, or sorry, this is this is just from Bryce in all 2014. They highlighted it. And you'll see that the cloudy zone actually uh, has a fairly uniform magnetization uh, across the cloudy zone, where we expect that we would find some uh, two-domain, multi-domain uh, tetratinite. Um, we do notice that the tetratinite rim here um, is multi-domain, which is what we'd expect based on our uh, micronetic modeling. So that's not very surprising. But the cloudy zone is very uniform. So the question becomes, why is this the case? So this is where we kind of have to go back to tetrachainite interactions. And so all the modeling I was doing was on non-interacting tetrachainite, but we, we now have to kind of come back in and figure out where this falls into the story. Um, so if we imagine that we have a 60 nanometer tetrachainite cube next to a 70 uh, nanometer tetrachainite cube. That 70 nanometer cube is actually in a two domain state. Um, so kind of just my little cartoon here. But if we remember back at the hysteresis loop for that 70 nanometer grain, we see that um, if we can destroy the domain wall, it will become single domain and actually stay there. As I said before, that field that you need is much too strong for a planetary field. Uh, but it turns out that if you kind of just do some back and envelope calculations and treat that 60 nanometer grain as a dipole, uh, the field that it produces on the tetrachainite grain next to it is about 275 millitesla, which is just the right, the right order of magnitude needed to actually display uh, move that domain wall and potentially destroy it. And so what we get from that um, is, sorry, there we go, moving it to 70 nanometer uh, single domain grain here. Um, and so we actually try this with marrow a little bit by placing two uh, tetrachainite grains next to each other. So what I'm showing here on the left is what an initial version of two 70 nanometer cubes where one is in a single domain grain state and one is in a two domain state. And if we let the system minimize its energy, we find that the uh, tetrachainite grain that initially was in a two domain state has displaced this domain wall um, to grow the, do the domain that's in the same direction as an initially single domain state. Um, and so what we take away from this is that tetrachainite interactions provide a potential me method of creating single domain grains from an initially two domain state. And this is important because uh, therefore these interactions might be really a primary reason why we can conduct paleomagnetic studies on the tetrachainite in the cloudy zone in the first place and interpret their magnetic record. Since without these interactions, we would expect to find two domain grains rather than a bunch of uniform uh, magnetization. So I know I'm, I'm starting to run out of time here, so I'm almost done, I promise. Um, so I've been talking mostly about interacting tetrachainite in terms of implications, but I just do want to point out uh, non-interacting tetrachainite as well. So these are, uh, as I said before, this is a, a placidic microstructure. We have tetrachainite grains embedded in a chamosite matrix. And I'm going to kind of zoom in on this little bottom left corner here and show a very similar uh, plot as I showed for the cloudy zone. Um, so this that B panel in the middle is one of these XMCD images. So this shows the direction of magnetization relative to a probe beam. And what we see is that I've kind of boxed one of these grains here, this magenta one. And we see that in the absence of these uh, actual interactions, you can have what looks like to be a two domain tetrachainite. And that if you plot the length and axial ratio of that grain on our Butler Banerjee diagram, you find that it does fall in that two domain stable state. So that's kind of cool that you know we mostly look at tetrachainite from this interacting cloudy zone point of view, but in the absence of interactions, you can actually have 
a tutamine uh, tetrachinite grain. So just to wrap up here um, and kind of lay, go through all the, these takeaways that I've had, um, tetrachinite has this really high magnetocrystalline isotropy that is really what makes it different from other paleomagnetic recorders. But one of, and in part, it's because that it cannot form a single vortex state, which limits the sizes of grains that should be able to hold these interpretable paleomagnetic records. And in the absence of that state, ideally, that means that tetrachinite should only occupy a single domain state for about six to 160 nanometers. However, what we see is that two domain tetrachinite can actually retain its magnetization over the lifetime of the solar system. Um, and it's very, um, it's also resistant to remagnetization as well. Oops, there we go. And it's resistant to remagnetization. Um, and, and just uh, two more here. Uh, two domain tetrachinite can actually be placed in a stable single domain state if we have a mechan mechanism to destroy that domain wall. And lastly, um, where that ties in is that the interactions between tetrachinite grains in a cloud zone might be a really key role or key reason why we can use them as paleomagnetic recorders. Um, and so if you have any further questions about that, about this, and I'm happy to answer them here, but also point you to the paper that we put out in November um, that kind of walks through all this stuff here. And I think that's all I have. Yeah. Right at 25. Oh, okay, Eli, thank you very much. It was a, a very cool talk. Very nice talk. And, and do, do you work with Ben Wise? I, I know him. Yeah, I yeah, Ben Wise is my advisor. You are you were in that lab. Yep. Oh, he's just just getting okay so <laughs> he just joined we have uh <laughs> win williams uh we have one question okay uh go ahead hi eli nice talk <clears throat> the, just one thing occurred to me when you were showing the cloudy zone you know when you look at magnetite obviously a completely different material as you as you pointed out but when you see um tightly interacting magnetite uh it, they often form supra vortex states, right? So a vortex state across multiple different grains. Mm -hmm. you, you might think in the cloudy zone that you, sh you, you, you might also get that type of formation as well, but everything in your cloudy zone seems to be aligned completely in the same direction. Is that right? Yeah, it looks like it is. And this is not the case for all cloudy zones. Um, I've showed one particular example, but if you do look at other cloudy zones, you'll see there is some um, difference in magnetization direction um, and kind of, there'll be kind of regions that are uniformly magnetized in one direction and then some that are in a little bit of the other direction. But there, there I would say the conglomerate tetrachinite as a whole um, in these regions do look uniform. Um, oh. I was showing a particularly good example, to be honest. Um, but you, you never see these sort of supra domain states that form vortices over, you know, because you might imagine they're just like uh, little packets of, uh, <clears throat> well, interacting. The interacting uh, would would allow them to form vortices. And the uh, I guess it wouldn't happen if all the anisotropy and all the grains were aligned. Is that is that true? Are there, yeah. And so uh, the cloudy zone tetrachina all have a um, similar uh, uh, ease crystal axis axes really? they're, not, they're not oriented randomly to each other um so that that's part of the reason why the uh they all look fairly uniform um yeah, so i don't think you would probably form one of these supra vortex states i mean there's no vortex state anyway but maybe something um that is a um not metaphorical but what is the word i'm looking for um, I, I was thinking like the states that um uh, Rich Harrison published oh, many years ago now in uh, Exalved Magnetites. Okay. I, I'm not very familiar with that. All right. Each magnetite is a single domain, but a, a, across uh, multiple single domains, they form sort of vortex states. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. But uh, but I think you're right. Because the anisotropy in all these particles are aligned, that probably precludes that forming. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's cool. Thank you very much, Eli. It's a great talk. Oh, there is a question from Brandon. Go ahead, Brandon. Hi, yeah. I uh, just want to say really interesting talk uh, to start with. Can you hear me well? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, good. Um, so 
uh, I, I had a sort of a couple of questions. Um, sure. So one was uh, you had these metastable states that you showed. Yeah. Uh, in between your barriers, you refer to these as metastable. Yeah. But your sort of energy barriers that you have are so large, and then they're they're smaller on that scale. Are those actually quite stable states, or the size of those metastable energy barriers? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, it turns out those metastable states are actually fairly stable, as you pointed out. The energy barrier between them on their own is surprisingly high. Um, and one of the, actually the funny things about this two domain structure um, is that it's actually the two domain state is a metastable state between two single domain grains. Um, so even if even if you took like a 50 nanometer tetratane IQ and you somehow found it, if you could put it in the two domain state somehow, um, it would actually stay there, which would be very weird. Um, the only the reason why I don't really spend too much time delving into a lot of these metastable states is that um, it's not necessarily clear that you're going to ever reach them anyway. The energy barrier to those states is too high. Um, but you you are right that on their own, if somehow you could put them in that state, they would probably stay there. Thank you. That's interesting. Um, and so when you're deciding these states, you initialize from a random magnetization and then see what domain state you end up in most of the time. That's how you're defining your micromagnetic models. Am I right in thinking that? You don't ever yeah, see any it, of these metastable states uh, in that process. You always see a single domain or a two domain state. Yeah, pretty much. Um, mm. I, do, I do remember there was one time, I can't remember exactly which one, where we did see, I did get one of these kind of curved domain walls, um, but it was very rare. For the most part, it falls into um, either a single domain state all the way through um, or one of these two domain states. Thank you. That's very interesting. And I think maybe a, a, something that's interesting from this is that um, perhaps, you know, single domain is not the important thing for having stable domains. It's, it's more. Okay. Is there any other question? Okay, so Eli, uh, this this titronite uh, grains, mm -hmm. I mean, are 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 they from one meteorite, several meteorites, and and where are those meteorites from? Where are they found? Yeah, so we find tetratine in a, a wide variety of meteorite groups. Um, they're mostly found in iron meteorites. Um, and I showed kind of an ex uh, a bunch of different um, kind of panels of cloudy zones earlier in the talk um, that I can, oops, how do I get out of my own presentation? It's a great question. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Here we go, here. Um, and so the, these microstructures, um, which is really what they are, form um, under very, special conditions. And that's why tetrachanite is also kind of funky mineral um, because you need extremely slow cooling rates, less than about um, 10,000 Celsius per million years um, to, to form them because you need to give enough time for the uh, iron and nickel in the metal to actually order into the right structure. Um, and, that, and that's what partly gives rise to this uh, very large anisotropy. Um, but so you, you'll find tetrachanite in a, a lot of different iron meteorites um, that cooled very slowly, um, but you also find it, there are some H chondrites, um, such as the one I'm showing here in the bottom right, uh, that can form, that have large metal grains that form cloudy zones as well. So it is basically in every type of meteorite. I want to, we don't find it in every type of meteorite. Um, there's a fair number of iron meteorites that don't have tetrachanite. Um, it's okay. really all about cooling rate. Um, if you can cool slowly enough, then you and the conditions are right, then okay, I, you I, have okay. tetrachanite. Yeah, it's, okay. yeah you're not going to go pick up like uh, any meteorite and find tetrachanite. It's very, it's very sensitive. Okay. Okay. Hey, Eli, can I Thank jump you. in for a sec? Is that Ben? Yeah, it's Ben. 
Hey. I just wanted, yeah, I just wanted to say like a beautiful counter example is lunar rocks. It's it's completely absent from lunar rocks as far as we can tell because of their their fast cooling rate. Yeah, and I, actually, I don't think there are any a uh, a chondrite meteorites that are not iron meteorites that have tetrachainite. I can't yeah, think it seems of it. very rare in chondrites. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great, thank you so okay. much. Okay, uh, thank you, Eli, for your talk. It was pretty cool. Uh, so, and uh, a last remind of uh, of our immediate schedule is that we are not having talk on April twenty sixth uh, because EGU, and we will. Uh, resume talks on May 10th uh, with France Lagrange. And our, all these uh, conferences are uploaded on YouTube. So if you can subscribe, uh, we have more than 100 presentations to you there.